Um, okay, so first I um, I submitted this uh, this abstract, and I was very happy that it got accepted, and realized that it's supposed to be engaging. Um, it's, this is not working. Fun, and no boring, por favor. So I was yeah surprised because I guess it was the wrong abstract to accept. <laughs> but don't worry, Wittgenstein, um, these are two quotes um, of him, of his. And I think, so, so I think like, we can handle this. We will make this fun and hopefully not too boring. Um, because it's going to be a bit messy, um, it's very early. Like, this project is something that I've recently developed. Um, I've started reading into Wittgenstein and connecting a few things. So I would be very happy to hear some feedback. And it might, in order not to get too um, lost in the space, I thought it might help to provide a very first outline at the beginning. So why philosophy? I would like to just briefly uh, address this question. Why specifically Wittgenstein? Um, then just briefly introduce Wittgenstein himself and his philosophy. Uh, introduce the two main concepts that I would like to work with. Um, from his works, and then bring all, uh, everything together um, uh, into, into, the, into the theme of scholarly communication. And actually, I just realized like I removed, there was a fun outro, but I removed it. So that's not going to happen today. I'm sorry. Um, why philosophy? It's as often, and I'm from Austria, so um, um, I did cognitive science, and we have like our, um, so our school is very close with, uh, it's a continental philosophy department, and so I, I very much focus on my subjective experience. So I really thought that I, would want, I wanted to give you an insight of how I arrived here where I am. So my bachelor's was in electronics, then I studied cognitive science, and at the moment I'm doing a PhD in scholarly communication at Simon Fraser University. At the same time, while studying, I also started working on open source projects which then uh, moved more and more into the space of open science, uh, which also feeds into where I'm at the moment. And as a broader theme, I realized that I've been basically moving from the practice and technology to uh, more theoretical things, and uh, especially the topic of communication. And in my case, Wittgenstein was the one philosopher that sparked my interest in the uh, philosophical side of things. And in this talk, I would like to briefly talk about the possibility of going back to the practice from the theory using Wittgenstein. Um, so what's the thing about Wittgenstein and why here? So this year's theme is engagement. And when I heard it, um, I was first surprised because engagement is such a broad word. Um, people enter engagement uh, as long as they um, are still in love or they stay in engagements. Um, artists, speakers, a lot of people look for engagements, need engagements. Uh, countries engage in war. And as a researcher, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a like, plethora of uh, types of engagements that we're required to deliver, um, which for me all boils down to even the more general types of engagements. It's, they are all types of interactions. And for me personally, Wittgenstein was always very important because his he works on about the topic of uh, the philosophy of language. And for me, it was always a focus on human interaction and understanding the mind, the world, how things happen um, from, a point of view of, uh, from the point of view of uh, interaction. So Wittgenstein, that's this guy here. Uh, he's considered, the, like, by some people, uh, one of the most uh, influential analytic philosophers of the 20th century. Um, he talked and wrote a lot about the nature of language and the limits of uh, how to determine meaning. And uh, most importantly, there's two phases of his work, the early Wittgenstein, and they call it a later, uh, later Wittgenstein. And recently, people also um, started to combine things to uh, suggest a third Wittgenstein. Um, but that's not of uh, importance for us. Um, that's a mess up in slides, I'm very sorry. And now, as I want to talk about Wittgenstein and make this fun and engaging, I would like to share a few very witty facts 
um, <laughs> with all of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, during the talk, I will uh, again and again just throw in a few life facts because Wittgenstein also fascinated me a lot. The first book I read about him wasn't any like um, important philosophical work, but actually Ray Monk's um, biography, which introduces his main uh, ideas, but also talks about his life, which, it, which I think is very important because, um, first of all, it was a very fascinating life, um, but also his philosophy and his life are interweaving, and you can see that all his, all his uh, findings, his ideas, his philosophy do interact um, with his life. So it's great. Uh, so what I love about Wittgenstein, for instance, is that he kind of gave a shit about the academic system. So he just wanted to write and bring out his thought, and also thought he's very smart. Um, so during his lifetime, he only published, published one actual book, uh, the Tractatus. And the second book that he was working on, the Philosophical Investigations, um, were only published and edited after he died. Um, nevertheless, he's considered one of the most important analytic philosophers of the previous century, um, which is really fun considering the current uh, dilemma of the publishing parish culture. Because here we've got, like, even though we have to admit that he's a philosopher, so the volume is a bit different, but still, it's quite impressive to see that the most important philosopher of the last year for a uh, big chunk of philosophy, published one book. And all the other literature about him is, uh, were mostly him sending out letters, uh, his students collecting notes on his lectures. Um, so I think that's a very interesting wit effect. Um, now to the fun part, his actual philosophy. So I will boil down. Um, some of his ideas and collect them into in, in two main parts. The first one is the idea of philosophy as thera therapy, which isn't something particularly new. Um, a lot of Greek philosophers and uh, several philosophers in between, so between the ancient times and uh, Wittgenstein also proposed this. But the main idea is that the activity of philosophy um, should only serve to actually get rid of itself and resolve the problems that philosophy and our um, philosophical confusions uh, cause, cause us, uh, cause, uh, when our philosophical confusions ask, uh, make us ask questions, philosophy should aim to resolve these questions and make them go away. The second one is his very famous and very central idea of language games, which he introduced in his later phase, um, which centers around the idea of meaning is use. Um, in which he proposes that the meaning of words, of concepts, of ideas is uh, deeply embodied and, and within the social realm. And so he deeply um, counters the idea that there's an ideal realm and our social realm, the reality. Um, OK, so first one, uh, philosophy's therapy. As I said, uh, it has been suggested by others uh, before that, and the main idea is that um, similar to, I know these uh, analogies are not perfect, but that's uh, quite common in philosophy, especially in Wittgenstein's philosophy. <laughs> um, so I'm rolling with it. Um, he gives the example of medicine that you take in order to get rid of uh, the reason why you wanted to take the medicine, of science you uh, pursue in order to resolve a problem and then no longer need to pursue that science. Uh, equally, Wittgenstein suggests that philosophy should be like a ladder that you climb to reach a point and afterwards kick away and throw away. Which is a beautiful metaphor, but I guess he was imagining something like that. So people beautifully using ladders to ascend the building, uh, get to the goal, and just now they, unfortunately, they don't do it, but they could chug away the ladder. Uh, ladder. <laughs> but then I thought, well, this is all nice and, and amazing and beautiful, but there's also very many <laughs> bad examples of using ladders to ascend things. Um, and then I found uh, looking for ladder gifts is amazing. Um, it's very fun. It's just a small selection. And obviously, um, 
I'm part of a Facebook, uh, it's called Dank Wittgenstein Memes. Um, they also like, realize that the, the metaphor might not be the best one to go forward. But I still like the main idea of using philosophy as a means to reach a, a goal rather than conducting it just for the sake of philosophy itself. So this is a very fundamental idea that I um, also support. It's time for the next witty fact. Um, it's kind of amazing. So not only did he only publish one book, but also uh, one of his profs at Cambridge traveled all the way to Norway to his uh, secluded hut that he built in order to uh, shut himself in and do philosophy um, because they thought he should finish his bachelor's. Um, so that professor traveled all the way to Norway, took notes while he was rambling on about uh, logic, um, returned to Cambridge to realize, oh, um, Wittgenstein should have added like a formal like, introduction and a conclusion, um, which Wittgenstein thought is uh, just stupid. And there's some examples of the, uh, of the letters that he sent back and forth with that professor, and so he never got his bachelor's because he just thought that I don't want to write an introduction <laughs> for my thesis. Um, anyway, so years went on. He became a very important figure in analytic philosophy. Um, so uh, Bertrand Russell, who is a very famous philosopher and a very important one, suggested that he simply use his Tractatus, the one published book as his PhD thesis at Cambridge, which he did, and that's another amazing story. Um, so currently, at the defense, his committee consisting of um, several very important philosophers, including Bertrand Russell, um, finally agreed to um, award him a PhD. And on the way out, Wittgenstein tapped <laughs> on the shoulders and just said, don't worry, I know you'll never understand it. <laughs> but he got his PhD. Also, he did not care about proper citing. Um, that's just one example. Um, and since books are made to be read and not consulted, I've rejected the scholarly tradition of specifying pages in footnotes. Um, which is, OK, like, he just did that. But then, I give no sources because it is indifferent to me whether I have thought, uh, whether what I have thought has already been thought before me by another. OK? <laughs> but very importantly, one thing that he does specify in his footnotes <laughs> is where he's getting his own ideas from. Um, so let's continue on to language games. Uh, another, oh, I wanted to shout water at this point. Sorry. Water! <laughs> what could that mean? Anyone? So, just this one statement, just one. If I shout water, what does it mean? Life. Life. You want to drink water, some water? water, water? I am actually very thirsty, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, water? Yes. It could also be that the building is burning in the back end. I'm actually, we need water. It could be that I've, I feel that a flood is coming in. Um, so basically, basically, Wittgenstein is saying that language is deeply contextual. It is deeply social. All these things, just having a water exclamation mark doesn't mean anything. Uh, it does mean something, but it's not useful to us as human beings because we are socially um, always embedded in the social setting. Um, I saw that I'm at 50 minutes. So I wanted to like, have time to just... Just talk some more fun. So it's very important that this is basically Wittgenstein states that instead of language being that distinct thing from our reality, so we are existing here and talking to each other, and language is this either logic, abstract, ideal, conceptual thing um, that we're using to, like, I'm, I'm now sending all my concepts and ideas from my head, using my language to your heads. And in your heads, you are mapping to this conceptual realm. Instead of this idea, he's just basically saying, this is just ping and pong. We are basically playing games. In this case, it's the game of an academic or less academic talk, uh, using memes and fun things and witty facts. And that's how this works, and that's language. Um, I will skip this. It's very nice. So if anyone knows uh, Fran Laurie, um, this is beautiful. It's three minutes of. British humor at its best, uh, basically boiling down the idea of language games and exemplifying what language actually is. This is basically meaning is used. He's really emphasizing the importance of actually using uh, of the context of what is used with words rather than just the sign itself. Wait, effect three. 
Um, I feel like I, I just I had the, I, this idea yesterday while I was finishing my slides. Um, Wittgenstein did the original mic drop. Uh, when he finished the Tractatus, he basically proclaimed, well, I solved all of philosophy and literally left Cambridge because he thought he had solved all the problems of philosophy. Um, went on to become a primary school teacher in the small town of Tattenbach in Austria, which is, by the way, 20 minutes from the school that I went to uh, in, the, in, in the Austrian mountains. He was a terrible teacher. Uh, all the people in Tattenbach hated him and were very happy when he left after two years. And some other jobs that he uh, did throughout the next years is he worked as a gardener, he was an architect for two years and designed a, a very impressive house in Vienna. And it's, it's very interesting that he was, he's a very, he was a very particular and very precise person. After, when, uh, the house was almost finished and he had one ceiling in one particular room raised by three centimeters in order to keep the ratios in balance and like maintain the ratios. Um, so just to reiterate, so we were talking about philosophy as, th uh, as therapy, so basically kicking away the letter once we've ascended it, and language games, uh, water. But what does it mean in the context of scholarly communication? So another very interesting, very nice metaphor that uh, Wittgenstein uses is that the aim of philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the bottle. And I would be interested in following this, pursuing this line of thought to look at the, the questions that we have around the meaning of certain things in scholarly communication, the meaning of ci uh, citations, the meaning of um, maybe even science itself. And so I'm very interested in the idea of how can we go away from these linguistic confusions, from this uh, urge to jump into the conceptual realm and just basically stay where we are and based in our daily conversations and practices, how can we use this to uh, think about the meaning of citations, for instance. And in the context of language games, it's just important to say that this is a language game. Science is a language game. Publishing in the humanities is a different language game than publishing in psychology. And so language games everywhere. And I think I will actually skip this part. Um, just a small remark. Probably some of you will know this. Uh, the metaphor of frozen uh, citations as frozen footprints was the original idea why I did this, because um, Wittgenstein's work is very metaphorical. He loves to use analogies. And I was very surprised when I read uh, the now quite old paper suggesting that uh, citations are frozen footprints, because this does not align with my current concept conceptualization of the web and the digital era. So I realized there's something happening with this metaphor um, that I think still a lot of people like. Um, so that's how I started to think about different things. And it's very nice to see that uh, very recently in, the, uh, in a book that uh, Cassidy Sugarman edited, Cronin uh, uh, is actually stating that it might be the right way to focus on uh, what is actually said, by whom, to whom, in what ways, and when, rather than focusing on quantifying uh, certain things, determining quality, what is determining the concept of impact. Um, so I was very happy to see this because this is exactly what Wittgenstein's philosophy um, uh, is about. Um, and lastly, I uh, just wanted to say that I think that technology will play a major role in this. Um, if we want to go away from these citations as these concept objects, uh, con conceptual objects and these ideal things that we need to uh, deal with to a more practice-based uh, approach. I think that uh, initiatives such as the, uh, uh, the ORCID, uh, Crossref, Open Citation, so in basically infrastructure to connect individuals, to connect ideas, to connect papers, different forms of publications, the communication pre-review needs to be more immediate and um, there's a reason why the established metaphors were frozen footprints, signposts left behind to be found. Um, so I think technology will play a major role. And in some conversations, I was, uh, people mentioned that this is interesting, but we're just talking about the new form of scholarly communication, a new form of science, and which will come with new problems. And I recently start, started to actually think about 
whether that is true, because I feel like these new forms of technology, these new um, uh, forms of science are actually revealing the basic nature of, um, of science as it was, um, of, science as a convers uh, of, of citations as a conversation rather than frozen footprints. So thank you, and let's play another language game of questions. That was very, very nice. Uh, uh, um, I have two questions. One is, uh, do you think that uh, Wittgenstein was a, an experimentalist? You know, slapping the shoulders of his, uh, his advisors. You know, he wanted to see a response. Yeah. You know, he, uh, he's doing an experiment. He has a hypothesis. I think he had a lot of hypotheses. I'm not sure if he actually did experimentation in the way that we well, would expect uh, to confirm the results. Well, no, an experiment is you, you, you act, you see what happens, and then you reinterpret. I think the problem is the reinterpretation part. I think he did not <laughs> reinterpret <laughs> results. Um, I guess my, my other question is that, um, you know, when you talk about language games, uh, on the one hand, there's technical language, where people to decide to not play anymore. <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, there's this idea of the magic circle of the game. Um, where, where, as long as you all agree, you can change the rules as you go along. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert, in, like, I'm not a philosopher by training, but I, as far as I understood, Wittgenstein really wanted to push the idea of, like, this technical language of stop, that, that part of stop, stopping to play games does not exist. Even uh, the, 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 the epitome of formal language logics, formal logic, um, he emphasized again and again that this is something that we agreed upon and brings a lot of examples of like an alien species uh, with um, of different like dimensional uh, perception would come up with a diff totally different form of logic and maths. So, yeah. I, I would recommend, by the way, uh, Irving Goffman's frame analysis on language games. It's oh. fascinating. Uh, but I'm sorry, I think I missed the point <laughs> yeah. in the sense uh, you're speaking about the criticism or, or the viewpoint of Wittgenstein and language games and you apply it to citations. And it's not clear to me, I mean, it's clear to me that citations are language games, but what are you proposing as a change to the, to the rules or how it, does that inform how you want to change how citations are handled? Could yeah. you develop that? Yes. Um, I think the answer is twofold. So first of all, there's a more formal theoretical part to it, where uh, a lot of um, uh, scholars in citation theory and scholarly communications have been focusing on, um, it's here. Um, so it's, it's this recent book, edited by, uh, by Sugimoto, Citations as Signs or se uh, Semiotic Devices is Constant Thread in Theories of Citation. So this still exists, even though we are going into the direction of people are approving of science being a very communicative, very dynamic thing. Um, there's still this embedded idea that they stand for something um, in a, a very different than what we are seeing here. So that's, I would say, number one, uh, the first point that language games would definitely say that this is not true. So that's a very concrete thing that Wittgenstein's philosophy, I think, would uh, disagree, with, disagree with, and the second point that I would like to, that I have not elaborated in detail is the part of the technology play. So again, I want to return from theory to practice. So I would really want to in the future explore more how future technologies, future uh, applications would play out in this idea of language games and science as a as actual communication. Thank you very much for having me torture with philosophy in the morning. <laughs>